Hey, Nathaniel Fawson. I'm an archaeologist and I specialize in the pre-colonial archaeology of North America's eastern woodlands. And it's in this area that I've been working and studying and in some cases teaching for over 10 years. Um, today I want to talk about the monuments of the southeastern United States. I recently had to give a lecture on these kinds of sites and I figured I should do a full video version. So throughout this video there will be uh, sites and ideas that I've talked about before. Uh, and if I've already made content about something that I reference in here, uh, you'll find the link to that video down in the, the description. So there's a few reasons that I wanted to do a uh, discussion of these monuments. The biggest reason is that I found that they've really been drowned out by a lot of old world monuments like the pyramids and some damn wall in China, and to a lesser extent uh, by Mesoamerican stone architecture built by people like the Maya and the Aztec. Um, now, my, my archaeologist friends who work primarily in other parts of the world, some of them are surprised to find out that Native Americans built monuments in the first place. And most of my friend, U.S.-based friends who are not archaeologists also don't seem to know anything about them or even that they exist until I tell them about them. So uh, only it's seemingly only a few professionals know anything about these sites and a few enthusiasts here and there and almost nobody else. And that's a problem because America did not become important after 1492. This, this place matters, these people matter, and their work is worth preserving. But that's not going to happen if the only a handful of professionals are the only people talking about these monuments. So I'm going to go and do a chronological thing here and start in the Middle Archaic. We're going to start at a site called Watson Break in Louisiana. This isn't the first monumental earthwork in the country, but of the first generation of North American earthworks, it is the most complex and the most labor intensive. Around 6,000 years ago, during a time that we call the Middle Archaic period, a ring of artificial hills that archaeologists called mounds were built on top of what had once been a nearly permanent village here in northeast Louisiana. Uh, this began before the onset of the Bronze Age in Europe, and it happened before the pyramids or the Stone Age or Scarabray were built on the other side of the Atlantic. And in North America, farming wouldn't be invented for another 2,000 years or so. These people hadn't even started making pottery yet. So it has a couple of sister sites called the Caney and Frenchman's Bend sites, and they all have a very similar layout. There's a central plaza that's kept clean of archaeological debris, like food waste, uh, broken piece of ch pieces of chipstone tool, things like that. They're either removed or they're not brought in in the first place. This plaza is surrounded by a ring of earthen mounds. Typically, the two tallest are located just opposite each other. Um, rather than being right next to each other, they're across the, uh, the plaza from each other. Now, what makes this so remarkable is that it was built by hunter-gatherers. Uh, you know, not farming at all, getting all of their resources off of the, the landscape, not producing those uh, resources in the same way that uh, other kinds of economies will. And they're doing this basket by basket load of specifically selected uh, soil, clays, uh, silts, things like that. So here's a map of Caney Mounds, and you can see in comparison to um, Watson Brake, it's basically the same thing. You've got a central plaza, and then uh, that plaza is surrounded by mounds, and the two biggest are set directly opposite each other across the plaza. So moving forward into the late Archaic period, we see the inception of Poverty Point about 3,700 years ago. Something we really have to understand is that people in the past have a relationship with their own past, just uh, just like we do, really. We idealize it, we memorialize it, and we eventually mythologize it. Think about um, like Benjamin Franklin and the, the kite and the lightning, or George Washington crossing the Delaware, the rocket's red glare for Mick Henry. This is what people do with, uh, this is what they, people do to their past, whether they have written history or not. By the time people began building Poverty Point, the earthworks of the Middle Archaic had been abandoned for hundreds of years. 
but people hadn't stopped living in these areas. Um, the mounds were known to these late archaic peoples, and we know they were known because they went out of their way to orient Poverty Point to fit with a middle archaic mound called Lower Jackson that had been abandoned over a thousand years before Poverty Point started being built. So the people of Poverty Point were actively adding to a monumental landscape that had already been modified when they got there. Um, so whether they were blood relatives or not, it didn't really matter. They're making a statement and possibly a claim of ancestry or, or descent by modifying what had already been a modified landscape. What you see on the screen is an artist's rendering um, with all the trees removed as it probably was at its height. And what you'll notice is at the apex of the six semicircular ridges that bound the central plaza um, is the, the Great Mound, Mount A. Incidentally, uh, the, ends, the outermost ends of those ridges are about three-fourths of a mile apart, just to give you a sense of how big this modified landscape is. So this is the second largest monument in the eastern woodlands. It's about 72 feet tall and uh, 3,200 years old. It appears to have been built extremely quickly in a single construction event that took under two months. Um, and what we might expect to find in such a, a, a massive monument is that um, Mound A was a tomb for some important political or religious figure, but that's not what we find there at all. Uh, no burials at all have been identified in the monumental complex. And remember that these people are only on the cusp of developing a horticultural tradition. So the, the social mechanisms for inheriting political power don't exist yet. Um, yeah, there was almost certainly some sort of uh, religious specialists or um, some, uh, some individual or group of individuals that are organizing this labor and organizing these people. But that kind of power is not institutional at this time. So if it's not being built at the demand of some sort of um, very powerful god, emperor, warlord type individual, something else must be incentivizing poverty, poverty points construction. So pilgrimage seems to be a core component of the importance of poverty point. Um, special, uh, what we call exotic artifacts, from the entire Eastern Woodlands region converge on Poverty Point at this time. So copper beads from the Great Lakes, soapstone bowls from Appalachia, carved uh, lead called Galena from Missouri, red jasper beads that are carved into the shapes of owls, um, and chipstone spears and knives that were usually from more than five days journey away. These all converge on this site and none of these exotic materials or, or goods as we might have thought of them leave. We don't see that Appalachian soapstone moves back up the Mississippi River towards the Great Lakes. And by the same token, we don't find that copper um, artifacts, beads or anything, are moving you know, down into the Gulf and then around to the Atlantic and up the Savannah or the Santee Rivers to get back to the Appalachians. We don't see those kinds of uh, reverse flows of, of materials. So it's, it's not a trade fair because as far as we can tell, nobody's trading anything. So a key factor in what's happening here is likely tied to the movements of the sun. Standing on top of Mount C, the sunset of the winter solstice sets just over the southern edge of Mount A, and the summer solstice's sunset is uh, right on top of Mount B. So Poverty Point appears to be more than anything else. Uh, it, it seems to be a sort of festival grounds where people from all over the eastern part of the continent were gathering, um, bringing in exotic arts, crafts, uh, tools, and likely in celebration of some sort of religious festival. I always compare it to something like Burning Man. Um, and actually, I've found some pictures of uh people that have compared the map of Poverty Point to the map of Burning Man in particular years, and they do look extremely similar. It doesn't prove anything, it's just interesting. But not long after the construction of Mound A, the gatherings stop. No further construction happened at the site, and the networks of communication break down. This collapse is one of the ways that we mark the transition out of the Archaic and into the Woodland period. 
So now we're going to move back to the Middle Archaic again, um, when the early earthworks like Watson Brake and Frenchman's Bend were first built. But geographically, this is going to be further, uh, further east. The, uh, the Green River has, uh, in Kentucky, has shell mounds dating back over 6,000 years. And this phenomenon is very different from what we see in Louisiana because it covers a much wider geographic range and there are far more sites. The easiest way to break this up will be to, into the mounds and the rings. Um, the shell mounds are more inland and you find them along the, the Tennessee River and uh, tributaries of the Ohio, while the, the rings are generally found along the Atlantic and the Gulf Coast. So shell mounds are exactly what they sound like. They're like earthen mounds, but made from mollusk shells, uh, which are abundant in the Ohio, the Green, and especially the Tennessee River. Uh, there are a few consistent themes. They're almost universally built along west-flowing portions of the rivers, and they are very frequently both feasting sites and mortuary sites. So human beings are often buried inside the shell that uh, these mounds are, are made of, uh, are, are built out of. And uh, dogs are sometimes buried there as well with similar kinds of exotic um, grave goods as were buried with people, almost as though the, the dogs were treated as people or they're acting as surrogates for people in these burials. Um, so, uh, like I said, grave offerings are included in, in both kinds of burials and exotic trade goods like uh, ocean species um, shell beads that would have had to have come from far away from either the Atlantic or the Gulf um, are, are really common ones. Uh, bear and wolf jaws are worked into a kind of necklace called a gorget and those are, are found with bodies also. Um, and these grave goods have been analyzed in a lot of different ways, um, with some interesting results. So, for instance, infant burials, um, disproportionately include exotic items that had to be brought in from very far away. And at Mulberry Creek specifically, uh, grave goods in general were more likely to be associated with individuals that showed signs of violent death. So things like uh, embedded spear points or unusual cut marks on, on the bones themselves or uh, blunt force trauma crushing to, say, the back of the skull, things like that. So unlike Mound A, shell mounds are built in episodes of feasting events over the course of years and possibly generations. Well, definitely generations when we're talking about the mounds. Um, and you can see that in the stratigraphy of, of this one up here. So shell rings are constructed similarly to shell mounds, but like I said, they're, they're built along the coast and they build up after uh, successive feasting events that occur over the course of years, decades, and potentially centuries um, as people you know move around and leave and come back and reuse them. And so they're built up layer by layer, but in more coastal environments. Um, and with this group, there's always a discussion of whether these are deliberate structures or thought of as structures, or if they're just accidental um, natural byproducts of intensive shellfish consumption. And I tend to think it's a little bit of both, that, that the one turned into the other as people kept coming back to the same site and the, um, the noticeability of these structures become more visible on the landscape. So in both cases, though, uh, shell monument building lasts until the end of the late Archaic, and then for the most part stops, except for in a, in a couple of places, and that kind of um, is in agreement with the other parts of the country where the, these kinds of interregional uh, communication trade networks just kind of break down. So after Poverty Point was abandoned, moving back forward in time, and those trade networks break down, there's an interim period that lasts for a few hundred years, which we call the early woodland period. But then something new emerged in the middle woodland period um, around the Southern Ohio uh, River Valley area, um, kind of where Ohio and Kentucky meet up. 
somewhere in the ballpark of 2,100 and 1,500 years ago, uh, we call this new cultural phenomenon the Hopewell Interaction Sphere. And burial mounds containing even more exotic trade goods from all over the eastern part of the continent converge on Hopewellian sites around the Ohio River. And it isn't long before the Southeast develops its own kind of um, expressions or imitations of this Hopewellian theme. In Middle Tennessee, this is called the Capena Mortuary Culture. And uh, lots of different archaeological cultures practice this, this burial style. So we don't want to uh, go thinking this is some kind of like unified um, homogenous culture. There's a lot of different kinds of, of people that are, are using this burial style. But this is when we started to see evidence that particular individuals were achieving a level of special importance in their communities over the course of their lifetime. Um, institutions of inherited status still don't seem to be entrenched yet. Uh, what I mean by that is that, like, if you think about um, a few hundred years ago in Europe, when a king dies, someone else has to be brought up to take their place, and they inherit that former king's authority and power and sometimes their wealth. Um, so the, the king is an institution that can have different individuals plugged into it. That's not what we're seeing going on here, as far as we can tell. Um, but certain people are beginning to achieve a level of prestige and authority and status um, maybe political power over the course of their lifetime here in the Middle Woodland period. Um, and important in individuals are buried in mounds with uh, copper offerings or, or grave goods, like uh, these, these necklaces called real gorgets that are made of, co that are made of copper, and um, also more of that carved uh, galena, like we saw at Poverty Point earlier. So these two materials, copper and galena, are what incidentally give Capena culture its name. Um, but peripheral to the Capena mortuary sites, there's something totally different going on. Uh, what Jim Knight called the Kolomoki pattern sites. And this is exemplified by Pinson Mounds in Jackson, Tennessee, kind of between Nashville and Memphis. So... Kolomoki pattern sites feature what are called platform mounds, and for years these raised earthen ridges were believed to be the exclusive invention of Mississippian cultures starting around a thousand years ago. But we now know that these were actually invented here in the southeast around 2,000 years ago. Um, and at Pinson, there are two particular platform mounds that stand out as important. The, uh, the largest of these woodland period platform mounds found anywhere in the country is called Saul's Mound at the very center of the complex. This pyramid earthwork has four sides oriented to the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, and it's about 72 feet tall, um, coincidentally about the same height as Mound A or at, uh, at Poverty Point. And like Mound A, it has a special relationship to the movement of the sun. So if you're standing on top of Saul's Mound during the solar equinox, the sun rises over a second platform mound called Mound 29. This second mound isn't particularly tall. It's only about 11 feet in height, but um, it's surrounded by a raised earthwork circle that creates an enclosure with walls that are about six feet tall at their highest and are probably eroded down quite a bit, actually, from their original construction. Um, but twice a year from the vantage point of Saul's Mound, the sun rose over this other mound, mound, mound 29, and whoever was standing within that circular enclosure. We also see some indication of pilgrimage coming into uh, Pinson. So Baytown pottery coming up from the Mississippi Delta, um, areas like Louisiana, Mississippi, Yazoo River Valley area, um, and Swift Creek pottery uh, from Georgia and northern Florida. Both of them have been found in very, very small numbers um, it, at Pinson, making it appear as though someone's bringing it in. It's not being made in any kind of large quantities, but uh, people are making the, uh, the journey up to Pinson with, with their pottery. So about a thousand years ago, 
um, another new culture emerged just east of what is now St. Louis. Um, some people would refer, refer to this group as a civilization. I wouldn't because um, I think it's just kind of a stupid word that doesn't really mean anything anymore. It's been stripped of all of its technical meaning. Um, but some people would, would still call it that. So for a long time, archaeologists thought that there were certain qualities people had to have before they would start building monuments. And all of the cultures we've seen so far have defied these rules. The Mississippians were the first people in the eastern woodlands who really play by those old world rules of, of monument construction. So their city-states were fueled by intensive corn agriculture. They had a powerful priestly class. Political leaders that we might compare to kings or chiefs um, were in, in place, and there are also craft specialists. Um, so this wasn't a unified empire, but a series of dispersed and independent city-states that, um, even though they're not unified under political rule, they're aware of each other and they're interacting with each other for certain. So at the first Mississippian city, um, which is called Cahokia, we find the most commanding pyramid in North America uh, called Monk's Mound. And this is the logical conclusion of the platform mound tradition that their cousins to the southeast invented. Monk's Mound is a temple mound that once had a wooden sacred house at its apex. And here we see um, also a continuation of that tradition of monuments being built in order to track the changing of seasons uh, using the movement of the sun. So on the west side of the city, there is a circle of massive wooden posts called Woodhenge. And if I'm remembering right when I was there, they look to be about four feet across, um, made from absolutely huge trees um, that they were obviously re reconstructed, but they were based, their size was based on the size of the post holes that were excavated when, um, when Cahokia was first investigated. And so these posts are oriented to the cardinal directions and um, others in the circle are um, set to points of the rising and the setting sun at certain uh, points of the year. So from the ground zero of Cahokia, the, the Mississippian culture and their urbanism spread across the eastern woodlands. And these sites are everywhere. Um, and in terms of uh, development for public education, they've definitely received the most attention. Um, so Okmogi Mounds near Macon, Georgia, was one of the first national monuments to be established by Teddy Roosevelt under the Antiquities Act. And it's still one of the best managed um, archeological parks in the country. So here we see uh, similar platform mounds to the ones that were built at Cahokia. And uh, some of them also used to have temple structures, wooden buildings, placed on top of them, and it appears as though at certain points, if not always, um, political leaders or religious leaders lived in those sacred uh, sacred houses, those temple buildings. Um, but here at Okmulgee, there's also something very new and different. So this is what we call the Earth Lodge. And basically what it is is an artificial cave um, that has a platform or a stage or an altar for the performance of ceremonies at its center. And you can see in the picture here that uh, a bird's head has been uh, worked into it. Uh, bird effigies and, and bird shapes feature prominently in um, a lot of Mississippian iconography. So it's important to note here that these aren't just monumental complexes. These are fully developed cities with urban centers uh, scattered across the country with uh, political hierarchies and urbanized economies. The site of Moundville in western Alabama is the second biggest Mississippian um, monumental complex in, in the country other than Cahokia um, in terms of its acreage. And some, uh, some really good geophysics methods have been used in recent years to map out the city that lies below the mounds. So these are frequently built on top of domestic sites, uh, monuments in general. Um, they'll be built on top of older cities and villages. 
So what what we're seeing is that a city is deliberately um, deconstructed um, and moved. the The res residential area is moved to the periphery, and what used to be the the domestic area is cleaned up and turned into the monumental com complex. Um, it's it's built on top of the old old living space. Um, this pattern isn't only found uh, here. We also see it at Poverty Point. There's a, a site called uh, Garden Creek in North Carolina that does the, the same kind of thing. So here's the, the Jared Davis map of Moundville. And a lot of those really tiny specks, those are the remains of, of buildings that were burned down and then relocated outside the mound complex when the mounds were built. And uh, there are several ideas about the orientation of these mounds. Um, there's some suggestion that it forms what's called a, uh, a sociogram, where uh, basically the idea there is that each one of these um, mounds is um, associated with a particular family group or tribe or clan or some kind of um, related cultural unit. Um, and each of them will have their own mound that they congregate at, at, you know, different ceremonial events throughout, you know, the year or whatever. So, um, importantly, some of these Mississippian sites were still occupied when the Spanish started their conquest of what would later become the United States. Now, wrapping this thing up, um, I want to think about why monuments are important to archaeology in the first place. Um, archaeology is not about collecting ancient shiny bullshit. We're not antiquing. Archaeology is about how and why cultures change over time. Um, the ways in which people are interacting with their environment and with each other and what's driving those changes. So we're not really interested in the monuments in and of themselves. What, what we're seeing is that people occupy a place, they build a monument, they abandon the monument, the real questions that monuments pose to us as, as scientists are things like, what got people who didn't used to build monuments to start building monuments? How did their use of those monuments and construction of them change over time? Um, why did they stop using them? Why did they build them here and not there? So monuments are cool. They, they catch your attention. They capture your imagination. That's what they're designed to do. Um, but what I really want to get across here is that there's a lot more going on with these sites than just impressive feats of soil-based engineering. Wherever these shows up, these are beacons on the landscape that tell us that people are interacting with each other in new ways. It means that the social landscape has changed, and these people are reacting to that fact by modifying their physical landscape. Now, lastly, um, go see these places. Uh, a lot of them have been turned into really excellent um, museums and archaeological parks across the country. And uh, they, some of them offer tours that you can take with um, some interpretation. Um, and I can talk about them all day, but there's really no substitute for actually going and seeing one and, you know, standing on top of Saul's Mound and seeing the, the surrounding modified landscape from that vantage point. So, obviously, I wasn't able to cover everything, and I'm sure I'll be adding some uh, addendums and follow-up videos in the future, but for now, that's where I'm going to stop. So, um, as usual, if you have any questions, please leave those in the comments. And, as always, thank you for watching this extra-long video.